My name is Cheryl Lovato-Niles. I'm with WCU Extension in Whatcom County, and I'm part of the planning team for WIND for this symposium. And uh, it is my pleasure uh, today to introduce Dr. Brandy Camerman's, who will share her presentation titled Searching for Alexandrium and Hooligans, Salish Sea Research Center Applies Molecular Methods to Inform Communities About Microalgae and Forage Fish. Dr. Camerman's is a postdoc and molecular researcher at the Salish Sea Research Center at the Northwest Indian College. She earned her BS in biology from the University of New Mexico and also has an MS in geobiology from the University of New Mexico. Brandy earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota in biogeology. As a postdoc and molecular researcher at the Salish Sea Research Center, she uses environmental DNA and quantitative polymerase chain reaction techniques to detect and quantify microalgae and a species of anadromous fish in Bellingham and Lummi Bay. The research she conducts is deemed a high priority by the leadership of tribes, tribes served by the Northwest Indian College. Dr. Cameron Hens is Navajo and from Gallup, New Mexico. It is her career goal to contextualize genetic research and make it relevant to indigenous communities. And if you are ready to go, Dr. Cameramans, I will turn it over to you. Is it still showing my notes or is it no, only no, showing this your slide? slide now? Yep. Great. Great. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to see my talk. Yat A, Brandy and Chia, Nahombani Nishle. Hello, my name is Brandy and my clan is where the gray streak ends. I am going to first acknowledge the people and funding that have made this work possible. We work collaboratively with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Lummi Natural Resources. We have funding from the National Science Foundation and from NIFA. The research conducted is, do is done through the Salish Sea Research Center. We foster respect for indigenous knowledge of nature and we provide opportunities for students to gain a solid background in scientific methods. And we foster critical thinking skills and self-motivation. We are a marine research center located on Northwest Indian College campus. You can see in this image here that we have our own um, seagoing vessel. And I have images of the, the staff currently employed. We have our director, Melissa Peacock, and our associate director, John Rombald. Rosa Hunter is our lab manager. Thane Yazi is our outreach coordinator and our boat captain. Rachel Mallon is the molecular technician. And I am a postdoc going on almost two years at the SSRC. At the SSRC, we do many different kinds of um, scientific methods. Our director is an analytical chemist and she um, focuses on biotoxin research. We have Rachel Mallon, our molecular technician on our previous research our previous associate um, director was uh, associate director was Rachel Arnold, and they focused starting in the year 2016 on monitoring hooligans in the Nooksack River. We do a lot of work with harmful algae and clam research, and we have a buoy in Bellingham Bay that Thane Yazi also helps to manage. Rosa Hunter coordinates with sound toxins and she uses microscopy to count harmful algae in the Lummi Bay and Bellingham Bay. I joined the team in 2020 as a postdoc and I was hired to utilize environmental DNA and to quantify species using quantitative polymerase chain reaction. If you look at the image on the right, you'll see two test tubes. Both have DNA within these tubes. One is fluorescing and one is not. The fluorescing tube has a hybridized PCR probe that lights up 
during a PCR reaction. And you can see this reaction on the graph just below the images of the test tubes. These are fluorescence curves. You have an, exponent, an exponential growth phase and a plateau phase. And where these lines cross a threshold, we have a, a CT value. And we keep track of these CT values to get relative abundances of DNA. And then we can take that value and estimate the number of individual species based on this technique called quantitative polymerase chain reaction. The first project I'll be talking about is looking for searching for hooligans. This is a hooligan we caught this last December in the Nooksack estuary. We are hoping to use environmental DNA of this species of longfin smelt. So instead of capturing the fish to determine where they are spawning and rearing their young, we want to use filtered water that has hooligan DNA in it and use the quantitative QPC, the qPCR technique to determine where the, the hooligan are currently residing in the Nooksack Worth of Bay. So longfin smelt hooligan or Sprinca salixes are osmorids. And I have a map shown here showing their geographic location on the western coast of North America. They are known to inhabit Alaska, Canada, Washington State, Oregon, and California. I have zoomed in on northwestern Washington. And you can see here that our population of hooligan are not on the map. So they are not in the academic literature. Although they are well known by the Lummi Nation, they are a food source, and they are a culturally important food source for the Lummi Nation. If you want to read more about the work that Rachel Mallon and Rachel Arnold have done previous to my time at the SSRC, there is an article in the Puget Sound. I have the link um, noted here at the bottom of this slide. They, the hooligan are a known declining forage fish, and Lummi Nation would like to know where they are spawning. Traditional ecological knowledge tells us that they come every fall and that at some point they were running as far as Ferndale. And we know that the numbers are declining and people no longer capture, capture them at Ferndale. So here is our study site. We, I have highlighted here in White Bellingham and in Orange Lummi Nation. These are our field sites. They surround the Lummi Peninsula in Bellingham and Lummi Bay. And I have the our Nooksack River field site locations labeled from Fish Point up to Ferndale. In addition to collecting eDNA starting in the year 2018, we also have Lemmy Natural Resources helping us. Jeffrey Solomon collects fish and donates them to us. He collects these fish using a dip net. The collection of eDNA was done when we know there are hooligan in the river running. So Jeff goes out and he tells us, hey, I'm capturing hooligans now. Now is a good time to capture some water samples. We started using in the year 2020, a Smith through eDNA backpack shown here. Um, and our student intern, Sandra James here is, is cleaning it in this image, but this a uh, backpack, you wear it, it has a pump inside, you put filters at the end of that um, long yellow rod, and you put the, the tips of the filters into the water, and then you filter water until, in our case, the filters become clogged. So on the left, you see the filter with filter, fil filtrate on it, and we hope that this filtrate contains DNA of interest. From the years 2018 to 2020, we have samples starting at Fish Point and then up the river to Marine Bridge, Dr Marine Bridge, Marine Drive Bridge, uh, Ray Horse Road, and then to Slater Bridge. It was in the year 2021 that we expanded all the way to Hogarander and Ferndale on the Nooksack and also started to look in areas on Lummi Bay and Bellingham Bay. In 2020, I was hired and I developed a species-specific qPCR assay with Andreas Lopez at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. This assay identifies 
the hooligan in our eDNA samples. We've tested it, we've designed it, tested it, and optimized this assay. And we know that it consistently and sensitively detects and differentiates our hooligan from closely related species such as night smell. Results from the nook stack are shown here. This is a heat map. And on the x-axis, we have samples collected in 2018, 2019, um, 2020, and 2021. On the y-axis, we have the, the field sites going from Fish Point to Ferndale. Key findings are that in 2018, our qPCR method has determined that there are higher copy numbers per liter of hooligan DNA at Fish Point and Marine Drive than any other year that we've collected water samples. The second thing to note is that Hovander and Ferndale were first sampled in the year 2021, and we were able to detect hooligan DNA at Ferndale on the 11th, on the 9th of November. I'm showing here results from our bay sampling. Um, so again, our x-axis shows the dates that samples were collected. The furthest left date is December 7th. That was the last, or this was the most recent sample that was collected, extracted, and analyzed. And the, data, the dates go back into January. So from January through September, Rachel Mallon went on the boat and collected at all of the marine sites once a month. And then in November, she started to go out weekly. And the green bar between November 2nd and November 22nd was the big flood event that occurred. And the question for us was, where were the hooligan before and after that flood event? And we see that the numbers are high and the 20,000 copies per liter on the 2nd of November, we had the big flood event. And then we see that they go into the 30,000 copies per liter number um, on the 7th of December. And this is at Smokehouse Road, which is in Bellingham Bay, Nooksack Estuary area. So this is indicating that a lot of hooligan DNA is aggregating at that location after the, the spawning event and after the flood event. Also to note, and I've added a calendar here, that we don't see hooligan DNA in the bay, either bays, Lummi or Bellingham, in June, July, and September. We see some signal at Whatcom Creek and Fairhaven Dock, very, very low numbers in um, July and October. This was the first year that we did a full egg survey along the beaches of the, the Nooksack River. We did these egg surveys starting in October and we stopped them mid-December. We were not successful in um, finding hool hooligan eggs along the next stack, if, if, if you don't, if you don't, I didn't know before this egg survey what this would look like. I have examples of what it would look like if we were to detect eggs along the next stack shown on the bottom. We have a, a spatula with both sediment and eggs um, on the left and the, the yellow circle is around a hooligan egg. And then we have sieves that we use kind of like panning for gold and I have a zoomed in image of hooligan eggs on the sieve. Again, this was a positive control. So we had a female who was full of eggs that we got donated to us. And we ran these through the what LNR designed, the sieving um, vortexing instrument shown here on the top left with one of our student interns helping us sieve for eggs. We ran the sediment and eggs through this and that instrument captures them for us. In uh, late November, early December, we went on a reconnaissance mission to find Hooligan at Fish Point and at Marine Drive Bridge, all the way up to Ferndale and within the branches of the Nooksack. We did this in late November, early December, and we were only able to capture one Hooligan um, at one of the branches between Fish Point and Marietta. I have that location um, indicated by the white box. So future directions for this study, we are gonna to continue to collect the environmental DNA and continue to use our qPCR assay to 
uh, keep track of where we find hooligans throughout the year in the Bay. And again, um, in the months of October through December during their annual spawning event, we are in, um, we have started to discuss potential population genetics to compare our species of hooligan to other long fence mountain other locations, specifically the San Francisco Bay Estuary. We are also working on generating otolith um, work. So aging the fish, generally they, the people will say that they're two to three years old, but we're gonna use otoliths to determine this. And also whether they're living mostly in marine or freshwater environments. We also have some nutrient st studies going out and we're hoping to collaborate with LLMA Natural Resources to do some field lengthened studies in the, bay, in the bays. So the second work that I'm going to talk about today is searching for Alexandrium. So at the SSRC, we are interested in toxin production by harmful algae. I have here an image of Rosa Hunter. She is our expert microscopist. She identifies all the algae in Bellingham and Lummi Bay. And the work that I'm focused on today, I'm showing with the cartoon of what's called dinoflagellates. And this dinoflagellate produces saxitoxin, a biotoxin that accumulates in shellfish and then accumulates in crab. And these are bad for us for digestion. It's a paralytic shellfish toxin. We monitor this biotoxin in the bay and in local freshwater environments with this, these fat devices that collect the biotoxin on the bead. And Rosa looks for the algae with microscopy using toe nets and whole water. I was hired um, in 2020 to design an assay that would target the saxitoxin producing gene in a dinoflagellate, um, Alexandrium catinella. You might also know this as Alexandrium fundiense and Alexandrium tamarins or marine group one. The saxitoxin producing gene is located in the nucleus of the dinoflagellate, which I've highlighted with a green circle on, in panel B. I am um, taking this dinoflagellate. So dinoflagellates are encased in cellulose plates. So we crack them open using liquid nitrogen. We extract the DNA from the nucleus. And then we use, again, the quantitative polymerase chain reaction to determine the concentration of the saxitoxin producing gene in the dinoflagellate. We have currently three locations where we have data for the concentration of a saxitoxin producing gene at Fairhaven Dock, which is FHD on this map, at BBB, which is the Bellingham Bay buoy, and at Birch Bay, our furthest north location where we've collected samples. In this case, we did not design this assay in-house. We have been utilizing a commercially available qPCR assay provided by Phytoxygene. It is called Dino D Tech. It comes in a kit. And they also provided us with a sampling apparatus that allows us to collect and filter three liters of water at a time. I show what the kit looks like on the left. The middle image is a sampling apparatus which helps apparatus which houses three liters of water and on the furthest right we have a 10 micron filter housing that attaches to the bottom of the sampling apparatus. So results are shown here. These are our opportunistic sampling that occurred at Bellingham Bay on October 7th, 2020, at Fairhaven Dock on October 2nd, 2020, and in Birch Bay September 2nd of 2021. I call these opportunistic samples because this is when I talk with Rosa, she's done her cell, her, her cell count of the algae and she's like really excited because she's like, oh, we have, I see some Alexandrian. We should see if the kits are working with your assay. So gray indicates that the Alexandrium species was not detected by microscopy and the beige indicates that Rosa saw the Alexandrium and that they were rare. The blue dots show that copies of the saxitoxin producing gene were detected by qPCR. And if you look on the y-axis, there is a saxitoxin producing gene per 50 mils. So we see that on October 7th, although Rosa did not see Alexandrium, we were able to detect the saxitoxin producing gene at about 900 copies per 50 mils. And on October 2nd, she saw that they were rare and that we were able to detect using the qPCR assay at about 870 copies per 50 mil. 
Um, unfortunately, that little asterisk at Birch Bay is that Rosa was able to see the alexandrine, but the assay did not detect the saxitoxin producing gene. I have been going out to Fairhaven Dock on a weekly basis starting in May. So that's what this graph is showing that weekly from May 19th all the way through October 1st, we have data points, asterisks um, on these states indicate that the assay, there was a, a value produced by the assay, but that value was below the limit of detection for the kit. There are two points where the, the qPCR assay was able to detect above this limit of detection, this toxin producing gene. This was on June 9th and again on June 23rd. These were dates, if you look at the color scheme, gray is when Rosa was, she looked for Alexandrium but could not. Um, she looked for them and did not find them. Light orange is that Alexandrium was rare and dark orange is when they were present, so one to 10%. So on days when she was not able to detect them with microscopy, we were able to detect them with the assay. And on days when she did see Alexandrium, we did not find the toxin producing gene with qPCR. So future work, we have collected all known published Alexandrium catenella sequences of the toxin producing gene from the database nucleotide blast. We have aligned them using Genius Prime and we've used an algorithm from IDT so that we can find areas along a almost 400 base pair length segment of the saxon the saxon producing gene and to determine where we can put our forward and reverse PCR primers and our probe. So the blue bars are showing where the commercially available forward and reverse primers are located. So this is the kit that we've been using from Pytoxygen. And the orange bars indicate where our forward and reverse primers are located and our probe. And we are going to deploy this assay on future sampling, future samples um, to compare our results to the results from the Pytoxygen group. Um, I would also like to say that the NIFA grant, one of the main efforts of the NIFA grant is that we teach molecular methods to the Northwest Indian College students. And this year I had the pleasure of working with both Sandra James and Nikki Garrity. We were able to work together to utilize quantitative PCR to detect hooligans in the Nooksack and the Bellingham Bay area. And I hope to continue to, to work with students on projects such as these. Yeah, I would like to thank you with my heart. This is my heart work. I thank you very much for listening. And I, I'm very grateful for my coworkers and my collaborators. Yeah. That was wonderful, Dr. Cameramans. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. We do have a few minutes for questions. And I do see that uh, we have a question in the chat from Maggie Taylor. Um, she asked, have you looked into correlating saxitoxin presence with DOH samples of muscle toxicity? I have not. That is a, that's a great question. Um, I would like to speak with you more about what that, what that is, if that's possible. I know that Misty Peacock, we, like I said, we, we have this assay that we're using to filter. So we filter cells and we look for the toxin producing gene that way. We also have this SPAT devices that collect the biotoxin on these little plastic beads. And Misty Peacock is working with Rosa to then um, determine the concentration of the saxitoxin um, off of those, those collections that are happening, happening weekly. Great, great. Do we have any other questions? You can either uh, put them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand and ask them in person. I will give it a moment.
All right, so um, Maggie Taylor has followed up and saying she'd love to exchange contact info with you and we can help to facilitate that. Um, we will have her email address in our files so we can certainly get uh, help to connect the two of you. And uh, if there are no further questions for Dr. Cameramans, uh, we can go ahead and uh, end the session early. Eleanor writes, great presentation, thank you. I second that. And uh, so we do have a few minutes before our next uh, session is set to begin. So we'll go ahead and uh, leave this session and you'll have a couple of moments uh, until we begin our next session at 1145. Thank you so much.